less than two weeks before Purim, and it's very exciting because of what, again, I say stress this again because of, it's so true. The benefit you can get from the Purim miracle, the symbol of Purim, the, the gifts of the davening of Purim, whatever, it's something so powerful, and it's a shame that people don't take advantage of this gift. To elaborate some more about uh, the greatness of Purim and the greatness of miracles in general, there's a psalm in Tehillim, chapter 107, which it's a custom from the Baal Shem Tov to recite this psalm right before the Mincha on Friday afternoon, before Shabbat. And the Baal Shem Tov explains, Nachman explains, that in this psalm, which describes the Arba'ashat Sechim Lehodot, the four types of people who have to give thanks to Hashem, the four categories there you have. The first one is someone who's in a desert, Midbar, is lost in the desert and, and he gets out. He has to, in the time of the temple, he would have to bring a korban toda, a thanksgiving offering. And today, someone who goes to a desert has to say what's called brikat agomel, the blessing for thanks to Hashem, who does good for those who are chayav, who are, who are liable, he does good by, by, keep, keep, by keeping them alive. So that's the first one in the desert. And someone who's chavush, someone who's in jail, when he comes out, he has to also give this offering or say the bracha. Also someone who has Yisurim, sickness to the extent that he's bedridden and he can't even eat anything. He's so disgusted, he can't eat anything. And the last one is Yam, someone who is in the sea and, and, and there's a storm and he's saved by the storm. So the Arba'a Shetzichim Lodot, the first letter spell out Chaim, Chet Yud Yud Mem, Chet is Chavush, Yud is Yam, Yud, the second Yud is Yisurim, suffering, and the last Mem is Midbar. And the Baal Shem Tov explains that every Jew, every week, goes through on a spiritual level these four types of dangers. To explain, what is a midbar? The first one, a midbar, is someone who is in a situation where they feel like I'm total lost. Midbar, like in the desert. I don't see anything, I don't see clarity, I have no idea what's happening. And I have no idea what direction to take in life. So confused, so upside down, that's someone who's in a spiritual desert. And what does it say in the psalm? What, did, what, what does he do? King David, in giving over the psalm, he gives the solution. So someone who's in the desert, what does he do? And those in the desert, they cried out to Hashem in the difficult, the tightness that they're going through, that they don't know what to do. And then Hashem saves them. And now that's the desert. And the person now who's trapped in a, in a, jail, in a cell, as a, like a prison cell, it's after, normally, when a person has this salvation, okay, now, thank you, Hashem, for showing me some light. It's like someone in the desert who comes to civilized land. Wow, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big relief, it's a big stage, it's the next stage of coming out. Wow, I feel relieved. So you think, okay, great, I reached the point. No, they take you now and they put you in jail. <laughs> what does that mean? That after reaching this level of coming to civilized land, which is the idea of knowing what to do in life, now, you know what to do, you have what to do, you're put in a constriction where you can't do anything, you're in a prison cell. You're like forced in a constriction, all these things pop up in the week, preventing you to do what you want to do. You know what to do now, no, no, this came up, this came up, and they're squeezing you like you're in a jail, I can't, I can't move, I can't budge, I, I wanted to, let, me, let me go on with my life to do what I have to do. No, you're trapped now. But, but, but I'm wasting my time, too bad. And it, from heaven, they're squeezing a person, what to do again? The, the psalmist says, "Va'itz aku el Hashem b'tzar lahem," and they call out Hashem in their difficulties. That's the that's again, and then Hashem saves them. So what to do again in this situation? You you know what to do more or less, but you're trapped. They don't, you're not, they're not letting you do what you have to do in life. You cry out to Hashem, and then the, each time after the, the psalmist he brings down a verse, "Yodu l'Hashem chazdo v'niflotav l'vni adam." After the first salvation of the desert. It says they give thanks to Hashem. Yodu Hashem Chasdo. They give thanks to Hashem for His Chesed, His kindness, v'nifleotav, and His wonders to man. And then again, after the second, after coming out of jail, now we can breathe. I know what to do now. Let me go on with the next stage in life. So again, Yodu Hashem Chasdo to give thanks to Hashem. And as if that's not enough, you think, okay, now you're out of jail. Now I can move and everything. Then Chasa Shalom sickness. Well, now the problems from within now. I know what to do now. Let me do it. But now I'm being attacked from inner sickness, not just physical sickness, but sickness of the heart, sickness of the mind, meaning that I'm being eaten away now from inside. 
Haman Amalek, if you want to call him, begins to put in doubts. Maybe you're not supposed to do like this. Maybe you're just supposed to do like that. Okay, you know what to do. But maybe it's supposed to be like this, like that. You're wasting your time. You're investing time like this, and you see it's not working out. And do this and that. All types of confusions were each which makes you feel so bitter. I don't want to do anything now. Like a person who's sick, he doesn't want to accept any food, any support. He can't. He can't accept any support. He's in bed. He's mama. He's serene and, and eating him up inside. What to do? Again, Yodu Lashem Chazdov Niflotav Niflotav. Sorry. Right? Again, cry out to Hashem and Hashem saves. And then again it says, Yodu Lashem Chastu, we give thanks to Hashem. Fine. So now I pass all three types of difficulties in life in the week. Final one, the toughest one. Yalu Shamayim Yodu Teumu, the one who's in the sea. What's this? This is the scariest one. It's where they lift a person up, 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 up. You, you get the boost of the spiritual arousal. You get a big light. But then, boom, they smash you the next day. You go up high. Wow, I'm flying. It's great. I'm surfing. You know, the beach boy surfing on the high, the high waves of Kedusha and the high levels. And then, poof. so you don't know who you are now. Okay, Hashem, you decide. Like I said, like this famous expression from Rabbi Nachman, or I'm a Malach, or I'm a Galach. Malach is a, an angel. Galach in Yiddish is a priest. Hashem, what do you want from me? I don't know who I am anymore. You throw me up high, and then I have such a crash from the next day, from this high, I have a crash the next day, or the, ne the next moment, and the next, and then the same day, in the same hour. I don't know anymore, Hashem. Am I up there? Am I in the Kedusha? Am I in the Tuma? Am I in holiness or am I in the pure? Where am I? I have good desires. You lift me up. I feel so connected. And then bah, everything in a second is taken away from me. I don't know anymore, Hashem. The biggest doubts of confusion that a person wants to fall to futility, Chas And this is the most dangerous one, because it's after passing so many tests in life, in the week, of desert, being, uh, no, not knowing where to go, and then knowing what to do, but being constricted, and then have being eaten from inside of all types of confusions and doubts of how to do things and this, and I just can't handle anything anymore. I passed all these three, and now they're bringing me high levels, but then they crash me, so I don't know where I am anymore. I don't know anymore. And, I, and you go through so much in life already, that you say, Hashem, how much can I handle? That's it, that's it already. I've gone through so much. This doesn't just apply on a weekly level, this is also in a lifetime and also in stages in life, in youthhood, in maturity, in uh, teenagehood, in the 20s, in the 30s, you have these sections of your life, it can be measured in, in years, in groupings, in weeks, in a day, each person has this happening again and again. And what does the Psalmist say again? Right? And it adds a letter. I think the word is Yatsilem or Yoshiem. But even there, the person cries out to Hashem, Hashem, I don't know what to do. Because here it's more, it's dangerous because Yetzirah is convincing a person, just drop everything. After everything you've gone through, and you, you were in the Kedusha, and they take you out totally, you're crashed out. So face it, this is not for you. So at that point, the person is really at the verge of just giving up, dropping everything. And yet, something inside, the Vav, this U mimits this Vav, this letter Vav, connects him. The letter Vav corresponds to the Tzaddik. Because the idea of Vav, whenever it says in the Torah, Vav, like for example, Ve'el HaMishpatim, two weeks ago, Parshat Mishpatim started with a Vav. So Rashi explains, whenever you have the letter Vav, Mosif Ala Rishon, it adds to what was mentioned before. The idea of adding Mosif is the idea of Yosef, Yosef HaTzaddik, and he's called the Tzaddik. Meaning, that even at this point, on my own, that's it. I'm, I'm willing to do, drop everything and give up. There's what's called the Vav, the Vav of Chibur, the Vav of connection, which is the idea of the Tzaddik, which is the idea in our context now of Mordechai, the light of Mordechai, to push every Jew, come on, just hold on, don't give in. On your own, for sure, finished. But we're telling you, there's hope. What you're going through, all the Tzaddik you went through, and they made it because they held on. You too, you can make it, you can make it, just hold on. Don't drop it. You're, and you're saying, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even holding my hair's breadth. They're about to cut the hair's breadth. And there's nothing holding on, I'm holding on to. And yet, he, he cries out to Hashem, Umi metzukutehem yatzileh. And then also, the person makes it, Yodu Hashem chasto. What comes out of all this is that there's miracles in life. There are miracles in life. And people who've lived through life can attest that there are miracles in life. And the purpose of the miracles the, is, 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 is hinted to it, the word itself for a miracle in Hebrew. It's called the Nes. Nes, right? In Hebrew, means a miracle. 
But also nes <coughs> means a, a flag on high. You put a nes, klunas, you put a nes like a flag on top of a high place that everyone can see it. The purpose of the miracles in your life is to push you up to the next level. Every time you have a miracle, it's, it's to push you up, to go higher. That's why Hashem is doing miracles for you. <coughs> Not to just to keep you low, but now that you should come closer to Him. You should have an advancement, come closer, and to be lifted out of the earth and the mud and all the schmutz that you've been into until now. The miracles that you go through is not just to keep you there and that's it. People have miracles and they stay the same. That's not the purpose. The purpose of the miracle is to give you a wake-up call and to, well, Hashem is trying to tell you something. The miracle is by giving thanks to Hashem, recognizing the miracle, this thanksgiving pushes you to go forward. <clears throat> All this is the idea of Purim, the miracle of Purim, which is absolutely phenomenal. That we saw that in, in, the, in the Teva, in the nature, in the story of, of Purim, <coughs> where literally there was almost no hope, there was practically no hope at all, really, it was a closed door, everything was against them. Up in heaven they were against them because they ate from the Suda of Achashverosh, the meal of Achashverosh, they bowed, they prostrated to the, to the idol of the Nebuchadnezzar a, a, a few years earlier, before that story. And, and all the things leading up, that they, what, what happened after they ate from the Suda, the Midrash says they fell, 8,544 men, they fell, they had, they had their all types of harlots and, and Goyish women, that the Jewish men, they got drunk and they fell into them. And it was such a decree against the Jews spiritually on high, and the morale was totally broken. The only one who was there to wake them up and to give them hope, was Mordechai. He went to put on sackcloth, screaming on the streets, crying out, and the Jews said, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. He says, no, you keep on going, keep on davening, you'll have hope. He's the one who instilled hope in them and in Esther. Esther also, in a sense, she gave up. And he told her, listen, you were sent to, to this situation for the next breakthrough. What? We don't know. How? We don't know. But you were sent here to make the breakthrough. So she said, okay, let the Jewish people fast for me three days, and with that power, I will approach Hashverosh, and that's what led to the victory and the salvation. But the idea is that miracles happen, and, and the purpose of the miracles is to the hodot. The, the days of Purim, like Hanukkah, are called days of hoda'ah, of thanksgiving. Because the thanksgiving that comes out of the, the miracle is what pushes you to advance in life. That's the, the greatness of seeing a miracle and thanking Hashem, expressing verbally. Hashem, I model I recognize the miracle you did for me, and I give thanks to the miracle by do, put, putting that do, the miracle now in your speech. This now pushes you up the next level. It comes to rectify what was that damaged in the first place, which is the power of speech. That's why these things happen in the first place. That a person is falling down because he's not crying out to Hashem, like it's like in the psalm. He's in the desert, so he should be davening. He doesn't know what to do. He's being squeezed until they force him to davening. Why? Because in the first place, he was not davening like he should. He needed this down, this smack, so to speak, to be in a desert, to be in a, in a cell, a prison cell, to be full of sicknesses, inner sicknesses, to be in the storm wind of a sea, in order to squeeze the person to daven. And if he would daven normally, naturally, he wouldn't need this smack in the face to wake up. The average person needs it. We need the darkness in order to be squeezed to wake up. That's how it is in life. And that is ultimately for the good to bring a person back up. So basically this is the idea of miracles and the goal of the miracle is, is just to give thanksgiving to Hashem for the miracles. Everyone when they begin to open their eyes and recognize that Hashem is guiding their lives, they begin to see countless miracles left and right. Only you see them because you, you, you believe. You see Hashem in your life, your eyes become open to see the miracles and it's your duty to express the thanks in words, to verbalize and thank Hashem, Hashem I see this. I see that the bank called me, I have another 20 days, that's a miracle. Thank you Hashem, Mama. thank you Hashem. I see that as a miracle. And they made a mistake in how much money I owed and they said they owe me money. Oh, thank you Hashem. <laughs> another person would say, okay, wow, you know, good luck. You have to thank, you have to verbalize it. That's the miracle of Purim. And that's why we say also Alanisim in the, in the benching of Purim, in the davening of Purim, we say Alanisim. And we read the Megillat Esther, which is the story of the miracle and the blessings before and after are to commemorate the miracles that happened in in, in visit the show. So that said, we're going to go to another stage, a deeper stage in the story of Purim. There's a mitzvah that's called the Firsume Nisa Bifnei Chol Am Be'eda. It's a mitzvah 
to, pro to proclaim and to spread the miracle of Purim in front of every nation and every, every, every section. In other words, it's a mitzvah to, to talk about the miracle of Purim, not just the actual reciting of the Megillah on the day of Purim, which everybody does because of this, because everyone has to hear the miracle. But on top of that, if you can add more and develop more ideas, Torah ideas, Torah insights to develop the miracle, it's much praiseworthy. So we're going to try tonight, Bezat Hashem, to add another leg into the poor miracle and, and, and what's actually happening. So we saw last week, we mentioned a strong connection between <coughs> Sarah and Esther. And that Sarah lived 127 years. And the Midrash says, Rabbi Akiva told his disciples, the reason why Achashverosh <coughs> merited to become ruler of 127 na nations was because he was going to have Esther Amalka, who was a descendant of Sarah, who lived 127 years, to be his wife, so it's only fitting that she should be queen of 127 nations. It's in her merit, not in Achashverosh's merit, that she have, should have the 127. This illustrates the connection between Sarah and Esther Amalka. And we said last week that the, the power of Sarah is illustrated in these 127 years. Like Rashi says, that when she was Bat Mea, when she was 100, she was like 20 in beauty. I think that's how it goes. And when she was 20, she was like 7, free of sin. Just like at age 7, she's a little girl, there's no sin, there's no Averot. At 20, she was holding at that level. And we said that Rashi's going backwards. 100, like 20, 20, like 7, which is the idea of starting again, always in life. Starting from scratch, going backwards. As opposed to the world, where they're more impressed of accomplishment and advancement. Judaism is, if you want your emuna to be fresh and to always renew, which by Hashem is the most important thing, Hashem Himself renews creation every day. We said, Chadashim la Bekarim, Rabbi Munatecha. Every morning Hashem has renewed the abundant faith, and also Hashem renews the world every day. We say it every, every morning in Davening. Hashem is always renewing creation. It's all like it's a continuation. Oh, Wednesday is connected to Tuesday, and Tuesday is connected to Monday. It's all just a chain. No, every day is a new creation. Hashem creates from scratch the sun, the moon, the air, the trees, you think it's a continuity. He was here yesterday, he was here 20 years ago, this guy is 40 years old. He was here last year, he was here two years ago, he was here 10 years ago. A person is being renewed, recreated. Hashem creates the whole creation from scratch. You don't see it, but it's happening there. And why does Hashem do that if I don't see it? Because they instill in us that this is the way that Hashem wants the world to run. <coughs> and always being new, starting from scratch. And uh, as opposed to accomplishment, you'll get there. But the way to get to accomplishment, to get there from, from, from 10, to 20, you have to go back to zero first. Zero, then you get to 20, now to get to 30, you go back to zero again. It's always hitchachut. What this benefits a person is that the emuna is always new. And the emuna, faith being new, gives always that person that force to always turn to Hashem and not to get old in his connection to Hashem. So that when something happens in life, ah, I'm too old, I don't have koach for this anymore, I don't, have, I don't have the ability to handle these, these situations anymore, he won't talk like that. He'll say, wow, this is happening, I know what to do immediately, to turn to Hashem, because I know that if there's a miracle that's going to come out of this, it's going to push me closer to Hashem. Ness, we just said, the Ness is to push a person upwards, visit Hashem. So, so this is the idea of 127, Sarah and Esther. And Sarah, we said, corresponds to Serara. Rashi explains on the word Sarah. Sarai, she was called originally Sarai. That means Avram's personal rulership. It's the kingship of Avraham was in Sarai. Now that she was called Sarah, we added, we took the hay, we put in the A, took away the Yud, that means now she's the ruler of the whole world. What was Sarah's rulership? The idea of speech. Because how does a ruler rule? He tells his subjects what he wants to be done. A president, a prime minister, a king, they issue proclamations not just by writing, but by declaring. I want this to be, I want like that. So speech connotes rulership. And that was that's the idea of Sarah, okay? And Sarah, we saw, we mentioned this before, her going down to Egypt with Abraham, being taken by Pharaoh, and then inflicting the house of Pharaoh of all types of leprosies, which he couldn't do what he wanted to do. He wanted to have it with Sarah. It didn't happen. And just opposite, it was Sarah and Abraham left with tremendous wealth <coughs> from Egypt. He gave him gold, silver, donkeys, camels, and that indicates holy sparks which were trapped in Pharaoh, who was evil, even back then he was evil, and the Egyptians who represent the idea of evil. 
and to, by Avram and Sarah leaving with this wealth, collecting the holy sparks that were trapped there, coming out in the format of wealth. And Sarah has the idea of holy speech, and far we say that is the letters of the nape, the back of the neck. Ha'orif is the same letters of Paro, who's always looking how to trap holy speech for his own intentions. In other words, that a Jew, the purpose of a mouth, the ultimate purpose of a mouth is to praise Hashem. That's why we were created, believe it or not. The goal of a Jew is to praise Hashem, to give thanks to Hashem. He teaches Rabbi Nachman elsewhere that giving thanks to Hashem is called the Sha'ashua Olam Abba. The delight of the world to come, above anything else, is going to be this attitude of thanksgiving. The greatest thing, the greatest experience, the greatest delight in Olam Abba is this feeling of just giving thanks to Hashem. We can't, can't picture this right now, but that's what it's going to be. That's the climax of everything waiting in the world to come. It's this idea of giving thanks to Hashem. It's a big thing. It's a very big thing. So that's the goal of speech. But now Faro wants to take speech away. He doesn't want to let that happen because Faro wants to convince people to run after mundanity, to run after a secular way of living, to enjoy this world. And the way to do that is to prevent people from the power of holy speech, to take it away, so that, it, that they won't turn to Hashem, they won't govern, rather they'll turn to this world to try to solve their problems and to have everything in worldly matters solving it, which is a dead end, obviously. But that's what Pharaoh wants to convince people, that's his mission. And Pharaoh, we said, has three henchmen, the three tubes in the throat, the esophagus, trachea, we went into this a lot of times already, the jugular veins, which are the means of eating, and by trapping people, by overindulging, that's the way to trap speech, holy speech, that's why they're located in the same area of the throat. The, the mechanisms of eating and of speech are both together in the same area of the body, in the neck. And the neck is a tightness, corresponds to Mitzrayim, which is a tightness, Mitzar. So all this, Mitzrayim, Paro, and his three henchmen, the three officials, they, they're there to trap speech, which is Sarah. So they didn't know that Sarah was much more powerful than them. The idea of Sarah going down with Avram to descend into Egypt. So they, the evil side, far they think, ah, oh, this is to their benefit. <laughs> Look what we have here. Sarah herself, the holy, the, es the essence, the epitome of holy speech coming to Egypt. My, 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 this is great. But they didn't know that Sarah went down with her power of speech, which was complete and holy and untouched. And by, by smashing Pharaoh in his home, she was able to elevate all these things. Fine. So now, take this scenario, this picture, and now we transport it to the story of Purim. Haman, we said many times, the Gemara says, where is Haman hinted to in the Torah? Mm -hmm. In the question posed by Hashem to Adam, when Adam ate from the tree of knowledge of good and bad, <coughs> so Hashem asked Adam, Hamin Ha'etz, could it be that from, from Hamin Ha'etz, from the tree which I told you not to eat from, the tree of knowledge of good and bad, did you eat from it? So the Gemara says, Haman and Hamin are the same letters there, showing Haman's root is in the admixture of good and evil. He's a trickster. He's able to switch and make a mix-up, which was the idea of the sin of the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and bad. It now made that everything in creation had an admixture of good and bad. Until Adam and Chava ate from the tree of knowledge, what was bad was there. What was good was here. Everything was clear. But then once they ate, from the tree of knowledge of good and bad, the bad became mixed with everything in creation. And they couldn't discern what's good and what's bad. And that's Haman. Haman being a descendant of Amalek. We said Amalek has the same gematria as Safek doubts. And also Amalek was a shape changer to fool people. Haman being a descendant of them is to continue that same attitude of fooling people, and tricking people, until with the doubts they just drop everything. So Haman, took this opportunity now, seeing that it was that the Jews were already 70 years in exile, and they were already they bowed down to the, the idol of, of Nebuchadnezzar. He wanted to seek a way how to take the power of the Jewish people, which is the power of holy speech, and to trap it forever. And once that is done, he can do a way to obliterate the Jewish nation. So the first attempt, the Midrash says, is that Haman was one of the advisors to push Achashverosh to make the festive meal. To make the Seuda, the, Mig the Megillah says that on the third year of Achashverosh was being a, 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 a king, he made a 180-day festivities for all of his big ministers and the big people and all the nations, all the countries could come. And then Haman advised to make an additional seven days 
for the Jewish population in Shushan, which was the capital. By being the capital, that meant the majority of the Torah scholars lived in Shushan. You had at the time there, Daniel was still alive. He's also Harvona, by the way. And also Mordechai, who was one of the top, top of the Sanhedrin. All the big sages, all the big Chachamim in the Sanhedrin, they were located in Shushan. So meaning, the caliber of the Jewish community in Shushan was very high. If you had a lot of Torah scholarship in Shushan, with all these Torah scholars, so it reflects on the Jewish community as a whole. So what did Haman plan? Let us try to make a downfall, a crack in the spitz, the cream of the crop of the Jewish community throughout the exile, which was in Shushan. Let them fall and eat of Ahasuerus' meal. Get them to trap in overindulging, eating forbidden food. There was wine served, not kosher wine. The wine is called Yenesech, wine served by Goim. The Jews ought to touch it and drink it. And that's what was being served. And Haman warned the Jews, don't go to the, to the meal, don't go. And 18,544 Jews did not listen. That was it. They fell. So this was an opening for Haman to trap the Jewish speech by getting them to indulge in, and eat forbidden food and also overeat and eat which, 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 food which is not necessary. And by doing so, using the three henchmen of Pharao and Pharao and the idea of Mitzrayim, even though it's not physically here, but Haman was borrowing their power to use it now to break Jewish speech, break the power of prayer, of crying out to Hashem and giving thanks to Hashem. Because it comes together, like we saw in the Psalm 107, First, there's Vayitz Aku El Hashem Batzalayim. First, there's a Jew who's in the desert, in the, the, the jail, etc., crying out to Hashem. And then, you'll do Lashem Chasa. Then they can give thanksgiving. To give thanks, you have, what to, you, have to, you have to have what to give thanks about. There's a tightness, a, like a, a, a constriction, and it is a relief. And that's when we give thanks to Hashem in, in life. So he wanted to take that away, the ability to turn to Hashem by getting them to eat improperly. They're trapped. Their throat is trapped. They can no longer talk. The next stage was what? All this was the plan of Haman. He knew that Hashirosh would get carried away. He planned it. This is all planned. And he got drunk, and then he ordered Vashti to come, naked to show his her beauty. She refused. Memuchan, which the majority of the commentaries in the Midrash, the Zohar, and the Gemara say, who was Memuchan? Haman. There's different opinions. Tosfot says it was Daniel. But the majority accepted opinion that Rashi follows in the Megillah, that Memuchan is Haman. And it's hinted to in the spelling of Memuchan, it could be re rearranged as Mum Khan. There's a blemish here. And it's referring to Haman. Haman called Memuchan, suggested to the king, kill Vashti. Kill Vashti. And this was a ploy in order to prepare for the entrance of Esther, who corresponded to Sarah in that generation to enter the domain, the realm of evil, in order to plan to totally obliterate the power of holy speech. To explain, Vashti, in Hebrew it's spelled Vav, Shin, Tav, Yud. <clears throat> we said in the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 letters, you have the five sections of speech. You have what are called gutturals, laterals, you have parts of the Hebrew alphabet that come from the throat, from the tongue, from the teeth. In other words, the pronunciation comes from certain parts. There's five sections. Tav and Tet are called linguals. They come from the tongue. Look, Dat, La, Nat. These are from the tongue. The Dalet, you use the tongue for that. The Lamed, the Nun, the Tav, and the Tet. They're from the same grouping. So Vashti, you can play games because of the letters. It's etymologically similar to what's called Veshet. You can take the Tav and replace it with a Tet. What's the Veshet? The Veshet is the esophagus, the food pipe, the main pipe where all food and drink goes into is the esophagus, right? So Haman, to plan the preparation for Esther to come in, he had Vashti, which corresponds to the evil sides, the Pharaoh's henchmen, which corresponds to the baker, the Veshet, which we say corresponds to the, the Sar Ha'ofim, we mentioned before, if you remember these classes before, that the Kabbalah Arizal explains the three henchmen correspond to the three tubes, and the Sarah Ofim, which is the baker, the king's baker, Pharaoh's baker, corresponds to the Veshet, the food pipe, the esophagus. That's the main pipe, that's where all food and drink goes through. The other two, the butcher, which is Potiphar, and the Sarah Mashkim, the wine steward, they're extensions of the main pipe, 
which is where all the food and drink really go down, which is the food pipe. By ordering Vashti to be killed, Haman was trying to pick up, make a major ploy on the realm of holiness to convince there's no danger for Sarah of that generation, who's Esther, to come in. We wiped out Vashti, who corresponds to the Veshet. She's not here. There's room now, even though the Jews fell at the Seuda, but now I got Vashti, who was even worse, the Midrash says, she was even worse than Achashverosh. She hated the Jews even more than Achashverosh. She had Jewish girls work, do work in Melacha and Shabbat while stripped naked. She was very evil. She's trying to attack the Jewish people at their source, to attack Shabbat and the holiness of the covenant, which is the two things which represents the Jewish faith on a practical level. It's the observance of Shabbat and the observance of personal purity. She was trying to attack that at its source. She was very bad Vashti. So Haman, by getting Vashti killed, and the spiritual realm, this is how tricky Haman was. He was playing games on even the spiritual realm. He was trying to show, look, Vashti's not here. There's no danger for the presentation of, of, uh, of Esther to eventually come, the holiness of Sarah, of the holy speech, to enter the Achashverosh's domain. It'll be, in a way, like a repetition of Sarah going to Egypt where there's no danger here. There's no danger. So then, the set, that was the first thing Haman ordered, and the Midrash says that on the spot, they brought her head on, he said, he, he said, Memuchan uh, said to Hashverosh, give the orders and I'll bring her head right now on the platter. Mm -hmm. He wanted this to happen immediately. So the Midrash says, okay, he, he agreed, and on the spot they cut off her head. No judgment, no bait mishpat, no court, nothing. On the spot he ordered to, for her to be executed, she was brought, the head was brought on the platter. Then Memuchan, the second decree he asked of Hashverosh, look, all the women who were there and saw Vashti refused to come naked when you asked her to come. The, all the, the minister's wives, what are they going to do now? They're going to now also look down at their husbands. Whenever the husband asks for something, they're going to say no. If, if now Vashti turned down a Hashverosh and nothing, and, and, and nothing happened, so too we can do the same thing. So he said, okay, we killed Vashti. But number two, spread a proclamation throughout your kingdom of 127 nations that every man should be sorer de veto, ruler in his home. Every man should be ruler in his home, because look what happened to Vashti, she didn't listen to King Ahasuerus, she was killed, so every man should, should, should be ruler in his home, meaning, for example, if the man speaks two languages, right, and uh, his mother tongue is one language, and he, and he speaks a second tongue, and the wife that he married speaks only the second language, so the husband has been bending all these years to speak the second language, right, so now she has to be forced to learn his mother tongue. Why should he bend, be bent to her to speak at home? If, he, if his mother language is, French, is English and he also speaks French and he married a French woman, why should he have to speak French at all because of her? Let her learn English. Let her be bent to him. <laughs> this idea of, of, of speech again, the speech concept coming up. He wanted that every man, every man should be ruler, that the speech should be according to the man. What's hidden here? The word sorer is connected to Sarah, again, what's the idea here? Is that Aman was trying to implant a pleasant, uh, what's, the, what's the word in English? A, pre a pleasant like airwave, a pleasant atmosphere in the nations, in all the nations, that there should be preparation for Sarah, Esther, to enter. Aman was so much working, when no, one, no one understood his plot. The, the, the Gemara says that when they, they got Ahasuerus' uh, proclamation, they all started to make a laughing stock of Ahasuerus. What an idiot. What a stupid king. Every man should rule in his home. Of course every man rules in his home. What are they trying to say? You know, what, is, what is this that a man doesn't rule in his home? Find this thing about the language. How, 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 off, how common is it? It's something rare. The main thing, every man rules, because the, the proclamation was Ish Saurar Brito. There's a man, he, he runs the house. There's the wife, there's the children, there's the family. Everything works by the, the breadwinner. He's the one who's, who's more or less trying to make things in charge. Fine. So, so they were laughing at Hashverosh. What does that mean, laughing at Hashverosh? Haman was playing a ploy even on the realm of evil. That they can't figure out his plot. He was trying to hide it totally, that no one should ruin it. So even on the evil side, Hashverosh and the nations, no one should catch what he's saying. So this ploy made even Hashverosh look bad in the eyes of the nations. It was a ploy that he should be not the center of the attention, but now Hashverosh, in order to allow things to happen. What, would he, what did he want to happen to Haman? That there should be serara, there should be the pleasant, the presence of rulership, in order to prepare for Esther, who is Sarah, the idea of Sarah, to enter. Now, with that done, that's what led the preparation 
that Esther finally came in. Now Haman, another trick he did, on overtly, his intention was that Ahasuerus should marry his daughter. He wanted Ahasuerus to marry his daughter. That was on the revealed level. But that was done as a cover-up, that they should think, ah, he wants his daughter to marry Ahasuerus. But Haman, being the trickster he is, being rooted in the tree of knowledge of good and bad, which is always fooling people. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's, it's not good, pure, impure, switching. His real intent was that Esther should come in. And that's what happened. And once Esther was trapped there, Haman said, that's it, she's finished. Mm -hmm. Meaning what? Esther, who is symbolic of, of, of Sarah, 127, was trapped. Meaning the faculty of holy speech was done for good. I got the Jewish nation the representatives of the Jewish nation, the 18,544, to eat at the meal, forbidden food, and they lost their power of speech, and now their roots, which is the idea, the spiritual power of Esther, who was, who was called Sarah, is also trapped. That's it. Now we can make the decree to destroy the Jewish nation, which he tried to do. The one hope that, that Esther had to wake up and to fight back was Mordechai. Mordechai, always, every day visiting her, to come in and out to see how she's doing. And then, when like the Midrash says, Eliyahu Navi himself came down to show Mordechai the decree in heaven, which was sealed to destroy and kill all the Jews. It's a time that Hashem basically gave up on the whole nation, because it was such a, such a, it was such a persecution. Haman managed to get this to happen, because again, Haman is not just a physical Haman, he's the evil force of Amalek, who's always looking to uproot totally everything, right? La Korta to uproot everything. So um, Mordechai was aware, was aware of all this. He woke up. He went. He went to. He went to, to Esther, and he told her, "You got to do something about this." She said, "How could I do? I'm, I'm trapped here. I, I go to the king. I'm going to be killed." So he he warned her. He said, "Listen, you were sent here to prepare for the next miracle, and you ha you're going to have to use your power of speech. And if you don't, Hashem will use find another means, and you'll be destroyed. But you were sent here to save Am Yisrael. So what did she say?" get all the Jews to fast for me for three days. Why to fast three days? To subdue the power of the fuels of Paro. To subdue the three forces which take the eating which is not done properly and is used to, get, to, to bring down the power of speech, of holy speech. Fast, get the Jews to fast in Shushan. These three days, no eating, no drinking. And by that fasting, the, the, the wording of Esther was Tsumu Alai. Fast for me. For me to release me, to be, for me to be able to come out and be, be able to approach Achashverosh and to plead my request before Hashem. Because in, you see, if you look in the Megillah, it says sometimes Melech alone, the word king, and sometimes it says Melech Achashverosh. And the Vilna Gaon gives the rule, whatever it says Melech alone in the Megillah, it's referring to Hashem. And you see in, in Esther's encounter with the king, it says sometimes king alone, and sometimes king Achashverosh. So there's the, in her talking, the major six page is talking to Hashem sometimes, and she's also talking to Hashem. But there is this power of speech that came out after the three days. It says, by Bash Esther, after the third day, she got she was wearing she was also fasting for three days. She was wearing sackcloth and crying. And on the third day, it says, by Bash Esther, she dressed, and Rashi explains, she dressed what's called divine prophecy, Ruach HaKodesh, a spirit of holiness from above came into Esther, who is the idea of Sarah, and gave her that power to approach Ahasuerus. And that's when the, ball, the whole ball started rolling in the positive direction, that Hashem made one miracle after the next happen, with the, the timing of Haman coming to see Ahasuerus, and this and that, all the amazing story of the, of the Megillah, but it started with this bravery force of, of Esther approaching after the three days of fasting. The end result, like when Sarah and Avraham both left Egypt with tremendous wealth, which corresponds to the holy sparks that were trapped in Egypt. So too, the end of the Megillah says, we mentioned this also, that many people converted. There were many conversions. Because ultimately, what is the benefit when the Jewish nation uses their power of speech properly? What happens is miracles happen. We said, when a Jew cries out to Hashem, and then Hashem if activates a miracle, which does happen when a Jew turns to Hashem, then he can give thanks to Hashem. As a result of this thanksgiving, a Jew is elevated. There's a ness. What is the ness we said? The ness also means a noticeable flag, something which is noticeable on top. It becomes noticeable to the world 
than what they're running after, which is due to Faro, Egypt. In other words, a, a, a world of, run, of running after just money and materialism, and that's it. People will begin to wake up and realize I'm wasting my life. This is not the purpose of life. It can't be. It's so empty. It's so dull. And this waking up is a wake-up call that many people come to, to wake up and to convert, which is what happened at the end of the Megillah story. And it corresponds to the holy sparks that Avram and Sarah took out of Egypt. And that's what happened at the end of the Megillah story. Is that many, the biggest accomplishment, accomplishment was that many of the nations converted of their own accord because they saw the greatness of Mordechai and Esther and was activated to the power of prayer. How Hashem listens to prayers and there's divine providence running the world, and it's only Hashem, there's nothing else. Hashem is, is ilat kol ha'ilot, sibat kol ha'sibot, and that's everything. This woke up people big time. So now one final thing. We see that, we mentioned <clears throat> that Purim is the only one festival that will continue to exist after Mashiach comes. All the Chagim will cease to exist. No more Pesach, no more Sukkot, no more Shavuot, because everything will commemorate, everything commemorates the living of Egypt, which happened in the past. But the future redemption will be such a miracle, you won't need that anymore. What miracle, what festival is most connected to the future redemption? That's the miracle of Purim. And that, like we said many times, it's a greater miracle for Hashem to be revealed through natural causes to recognize Hashem than Hashem displaying an open miracle. Of course you're going to believe if you see the splitting of the Red Sea. Of course you're going to believe. Who's not going to believe? But when you recognize Hashem guiding through nature, that's a bigger, bigger accomplishment. And this is done through the story of Mordechai and Esther. Now what's unique about the miracle of Mordechai and Esther as opposed to the exodus which took place by Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu was one, just a man. The story of Mordechai and Esther involves a man and a woman. And this hints to the future redemption, which is a joint effort on man and woman. And because it's based on this connection between the idea of Mordechai and Esther, you see something unfortunate, which is an indication of what has to be fixed and what has to be worked on. This is very delicate on this point. We see crazy things happening now before Mashiach comes, that there's so many problems of marriage in the Jewish community, which never existed before. Problems of divorce, problems of people that are not married, they're 20, 30, 40, and they're still not married yet. So this, this thing of not allowing for unions to exist, which parallels Mordechai and Esther, is that is simply, clearly, from the attack of Haman. Amalek was trying to prevent this happening at the maximum level, to attack. And we see this. We see that this is what's happening because of the power of the poor miracle, which involves the concept of a husband and wife, to activate this miracle, which is what Mordechai and Esther did. Right? So with that we see that this is what Yetzirah is attacking the most because of that when you realize that this is clearly the work of Haman so a person should dove in their most to affect Shalom especially what's called Shalom Bayit and especially for people to find their true Zivugim because more than anything else Haman knows that if the separation between Avram and, Avram and Sarah the separation between Mordechai and Esther is, continues to exist that will stop the final redemption. And that's why he's working hardest to attack people, to ruin marriages or to prevent marriages from happening because the joint power of a husband and wife, Mordechai and Esther, is what's needed to activate the future redemption. That's why Purim is the only Chag connected to the future redemption and involves Mordechai and Esther, male and female. With this in mind, <clears throat> the biggest miracle of Purim <laughs> should be that people should find the Zivugim, number one, the true marriage partners, and also those who have, that they should have Shalom Bayit, and that Yitzhara, Haman, Amalek should not come to an end. Is that the Shem Shem these miracles this year? Is the Shem the miracle of Amen? Amen. Questions? Yeah. So, um, we were talking about Esther came, in, came on the scene, you know, quite miraculously. You know, Vashti, Vashti uh, perished. How did Haman know that, you know, you were talking about his plan. How did he know that, that Esther was going to come on the, you know, you know uh, Esther was going to come on the scene? And how, how is it that Esther, you, you were talking about Esther,
being a parallel to Sarah. Sarah, Sarah. I mean, that's that's one one heck one uh, one heck of a Hiddush. A Hiddush. Yeah, but it's from the Gemara. The Midrash says that. Yeah. They, they they make this connection between Sarah and Esther by the number one twenty-seven. By uh, showing that there's one twenty, we said in the beginning of the class, there's one twenty-seven nations correspond to the one twenty-seven years of Sarah. Why why that's why that connection? To show there's a, like, there's many there's also Rachel, there's also other tzaddikot, you know, there's also Chava, there's also uh, Leah, there's also Rivka, there's all, there's other other women. Dafka the the, the, the Rabbi Kiva the Mikla, she mentioned that connection between Sarah and Esther, there must be more to it than just a, a mathematical equation. It can't be just mathematics and that's it. There's much more depth. So it's showing that there's an actual interconnection between Sarah and, and Esther. So now, just to answer what you said, yeah, Esther, she could have, she was a tzaddikah. She may have known or not known that she was the representation of Sarah. Okay? But that we don't know. That's inside the person themselves. They, she could have known, she may not have known. The same thing for Haman. Haman could have been just having a physical intention, a limited intention, but there's behind every person, and especially people that the Torah makes a big deal about these stories, there's also the spiritual significance behind them. So it's, not, it's not just a physical Haman, it's who the significance of Haman was. And in that sense, there's, there's much more depth. We can go deeper and say the Mazal, if you want to say, the Mazal, the, like the guiding angel, if you want, of Haman, who was behind all this. And just like it was, the Mazal of Esther, which is rooted in Sarah, was also behind her, to give her that power to stand up and to cause and activate the miracle of Purim by approaching a Hashverosh and inviting him Dafka, by the way, is another point, to eat Queen Esther's meal, food, in order to bring to bring her holy food. She served matzot, that says, it was Pesach. It was the second day of Pesach. By getting Achashverosh and Haman, even though they were not Jewish, they were going. But to eat of her food, she wanted to also subdue the damage caused by the Jews eating of their meal to now the reverse, that now they're eating of her meal. And Dafka, the highest force of food called Matzah, which is so holy. Matzah is the food of Emunah, it's called. It's called, it's called uh, uh, the Lechem, the, the Menuta, the Zohar says, food of, of faith. By getting these wicked people to eat it, that was her intent, the deeper intent. So it's the mazal behind these people that the Torah talks about. We're allowed to, when the Torah makes a story of Yosef and David and Melech and Shemuel and Shaul, we're allowed to probe deeper and to see what was really behind the scenes. Whether they were aware of it or not, we don't know. We don't know. <clears throat> Once uh, Rabbi Nachman, he revealed an unbelievable Chidush insight on the greatness of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And Rav Nossin, the disciple of Rabbi Nachman, was just so amazed by the Chidush. He said, he asked him, he said, could it be that when, you know, when these tzaddikim from the Gemara, they revealed their, their teachings, were they fully aware of the endless depth hidden behind their, their teachings that only now we're revealing? And he says, possibly not. They don't know that their, their words came with such a high level of divine inspiration that they weren't themselves even fully aware of how far-reaching was the divine inspiration in their words. So he said that what we did, what we were today, we discover back in the teachings of the Zohar or the Gemara or whatever, and we discover, uncover deeper teachings, they may not have been aware of that themselves. But it shows their high level that whatever they revealed was coming from a high level of divine inspiration. And to show us that anyone who the Torah makes a story out of, whether in the Chumash, the Tanakh, in the Mishnah, the Gemara, in the Zohar, so know that there's a deep significance behind every detail and we can imagine that we can, we can go deeper to go farther on, on the national significance of everything happening behind these, these characters. It's not just a physical character. For example, when the Torah talks about Abraham and the story of Abraham, so the Zohar goes on to say that this is the attribute of chesed, of kindness. And it goes on explaining the attribute of kindness and this and that. Wait a second, he wasn't a person? He was a person, but he represents something happening on a deeper level, on the spiritual realms. So to Haman and Esther, it's reflecting what was actually happening in the, the real picture, the whole picture, in the universal picture, with, with heaven also in mind. That what was really behind the plot and the ploy of Haman to destroy the Jewish nation? Why? Just a simple destruction, that's it? Because he was after something. What was he after? A hatred. What hatred? 
He's rooted in Esav, right? Haman is a descendant of Esav. And, and Am Yisrael, Mordechai, and the people are rooted in Yaakov. And what's the difference of, of Yaakov and Esav? Hakol kol Yaakov, vayadai mide Esav. The voice is the voice of Jacob. The voice of prayer is the voice of, of Yaakov. And the hands are Esav. And Rashi says, explaining the blessing of Yitzhak afterwards, that whenever Yaakov uses his voice, so Esav is subdued. And as soon as Yaakov stops using his voice in prayer and turning to Hashem, then the hands of Esav are strong. And that's what was bothering Haman deeply. The deep, deep under intentions behind the scenes of what was bothering Haman was that they, the Jewish people, so long as they have the ability to exist, which is their ability to dive in, so Esav can't really enjoy fully this world. So what to do? Destroy the Jews. This was his opportunity to get the Jews trapped. Trap their power of speech. Trap Sarah, which is Kol Kol Yaakov, the voice of Yaakov, which emanates from Sarah, the speech. And then Haman, the world, the Nazi regime, if you want to call them Hitler or whoever, they could chasishalom overpower everything. And Baruch Hashem, this has never happened, because no matter what the Jews have gone through, the Jews have always, when being squeezed, they used their umanut, their trade, which is not the trade of the Jewish people as a whole. Even though you have, you have bankers, you have jewelers, you have falafel owners, store owners, you have all types of Jewish people, right? But as a collective nation, our umanut, our craftsmanship is prayer. That's what we're known for. We're the chosen people that Hashem turns to our daven. He listens to us. That's our weapon more than anything else. Yes? Um. Could it be that since the Purim is the only holiday after the redemption that's celebrated, that could be a hint of how to be redeemed, not to sit around and wait for a miracle, but to actually fast and pray like they did in Purim? That's the a secret. Exactly. <laughs> that's it. But not to sit back and wait for a miracle. But the Daven first, the do the action, which is the Daven. We fast, as you know. We fast. The fast of Esther is not a joke. The fast of Esther even though the halacha says it's to commemorate the fast that the Jews fasted on the day of the 13th of Adar when the Jews had permission to destroy all their enemies. So the halacha says, the Midrash says, the Gemara says that the Jews were fasting because as a rule, whenever the Jews went out to war, they were fasting. We think we're fasting. You need, you need strength. You have to eat meat. You have to eat bread. You have to be strong to fight. By a Jew fighting a battle is totally spiritual. Even the physical is dependent on the on, on spiritual. For that reason, whenever Moshe Rabbeinu or, or David the Melech, whenever they would, or Shaul the Melech, they would send out the Jews to physical battle, it was really dependent on their spiritual status. And that's why they would go out fasting. You would think the opposite. You don't go fasting when you're in war. You eat, you eat well. No, because by fasting, they subdue the enemy up above. But there's no force of, of getting me sidetracked and using my emunah full force. And that's what is the key for the battle. So we also fast before Purim in order to help activate the Purim miracle. That's why it shouldn't be taken lightly, the fast of Esther. There's many leniencies in Halacha, someone who's very, a little bit sick, they're in bed and everything, they don't have to fast. But a regular person who's just looking for an escape, like, excuse not to fast, it's not good, it's Chaval, because that fast of Esther is to help activate the fasting of what Esther did. We call it Tanit Esther, it's funny. Even it commemorates the war, we call it the fast of Esther, which makes it sound like it's connected more to the fast of the three days that she said, Sumu Alai. So in that sense, this fasting is a preparation to subdue totally on pouring Haman Amalek, which, which reappears every year. Every year we have a new Haman attacking us inside. The spiritual Haman is trying to just cut us from our weapon of davening and Muna and making us feel that everything is futile and depressed and finished as a shallow. So the, so the fast is to subdue that and then we can actually mamash enjoy the light and the miracle of poor Yes? So, um, Rabbi Yosef, this is kind of like a technical question, but um, why is it that porn is so important in, in the days to come and it's a Megillah? And it's key. Um, um, it's like like Yom Kippur, which is like so embedded and close and and so important in the Torah. Right. You know, 
like it seems like there's a dichotomy. Like why is it set in a sense separated from the Chumash and the Torah? Right. Like and okay. Yeah. Okay. No. So it was, it was first of all technically it was revealed yeah. later. It was revealed later. Later, this uh, the, the the story of Purim, mm -hmm. and it's a story which Esther got the Chachamim of the generation to incorporate it in the Bible, which is amazing. That she got something a story. You compare the the book of Megillat Esther to all the other books of the Bible. It sticks out. It's like a fairy tale story. You have the story of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. You have the story of Nehemiah, of Ezra, of Joel, of Micha, of Ishayahu. There, there's a lot of prophecies, fine. But it's not so much of like a story which is dramatic like this. This really sticks out. It really sticks out. And she got them to include it into the, into the, into the Tatanach. And you see the importance of the, of the Megillah and that everybody's obligated to hear it. It's not like, you know, during Shabbat morning, Kriyat Torah, women are exempt. Men have to hear the Kriyat Torah Shabbat morning, women are exempt. Megillah Dester, no, even women have to hear it. She didn't come to Shul, the woman has to go to a special reading to hear the Megillah. She was, she was at home with the kids, whatever, she has to hear the Megillah. We educate little children to start hearing the Megillah. It's something which is of, of utmost importance, even in a way above hearing the recitation of the Torah. Well, what's greater than the Torah? Right? The, the Torah is the Torah, the five books of Moshe, and yet the Megillah bypasses that that everyone has an obligation to hear it. And that's what she instituted. So it does have, in a sense, in a sense, a level which is possibly even above the actual Chumash. Because we see from the obligation of people hearing the Megillah reading, you don't have any other Torah reading, even Zachor, this Shabbat is coming Zachor. There are some women who don't, are not obligated. Some people have a custom that women don't, don't have to hear Parashat Zachor. By men, we have to hear it, exactly, for example. But by women, there's some opinions, yes, some opinions, no. But by Megillah, everybody has to hear it. Men and women, everybody. So from this you see the greatness of the Megillah Tester. That in a way it bypasses even the, the severity of the Chumash itself. And all the laws of writing the Megillah are like the laws of writing a Sefer Torah. It has to be on parchment, it has to be with kosher ink, it has to be in the Kitab, the writing of the Sefer Torah, Ashurit, has to be with the lines, has to have all the laws of a Sefer Torah. So we see that it's at that level. Just that happened later on, that's the only reason why it wasn't put in by Moshe Rabbi. It happened later on. But it's hinted there. It's hinted there. The story of Megillah is hinted in the Chumash. There are many places where Moshe Rabbeinu alludes. I don't know exactly where, but I know that it's run down. That Moshe Rabbeinu in the Chumash alludes to the story of Mordechai and Esther and the whole Torah story. It's hinted in there. Two questions. Um, one is that, uh, that Moshe Rabbeinu was we call Amalek, um, in modern parlance, we use the term anti-Semitism, which is a man-made term actually made by uh, a Jew hater, a German <laughs> Jew hater. It makes sense. Wilhelm Marr. <laughs> to, to disguise the I level of Jewish. hatred. Right. So, so we're not, in my opinion, we're not using the right name. We're using a euphemism. I'm saying anti-Semitism. Anti when it should be Jew hater. Right. And Jews perpetuate this. There's a whole industry about anti-Semitism. And my contention is, is that evil cannot know itself if we make up another name for it. Like Haman, you cover it up. That's what we're doing. That's Haman. Since 1889, <laughs> we're covering it up. Jews are covering it up. Is this have any significance, or am I off the wall? No, there's, there, there, there's something there. Like we said, the Haman, to do his ploy, he has to cover it up. So also, using... But Jews participating. Jews participating in, in the, the meal, of, uh, the ball of Hashem also. Jews didn't listen to Mordechai. The Midrash says that when this whole thing happened, that Haman wanted to kill the Jews, the Jews wanted to strangle, they wanted to kill Mordechai. It's because of you that Haman now made the decree. It's because of you. There was also a ploy of Haman to get the Jews against the Jews. To do that, to pay, he had his intention all along to get this to happen. But he was waiting for the opportunity that it should, it should happen. It's, it's planned out. I have a big question, and I still can't find an answer, is that the Torah doesn't mention at all, the, the, the Megillah doesn't mention at all who these troublemakers were. That it says that as soon as Hashem made the decree, that everybody should bow down to Haman. 
and <clears throat> and he put an idol on on his chest. So the one who bowed down, bowed down to him, is bowed down to the idol. So it said all the ministers, all the people in the courtyard of Achashverosh were bowing down, and they saw Mordechai not bowing, bowing down, and they're telling him yom yom. It says they were telling it, they were telling him day after day, why aren't you bowing down? And he was like, I can't. I'm a Jew. It's forbidden for me to bow down to an idol. If he didn't have the idol on him, and it's just out of the technique, technical order and procedure of, of a minister of the world, a high minister of the king, I could bow down. But because it's, it's understood that it's out of respect, just like Joseph's brothers bowed down to Yosef. So it's not about forbidden I don't want to shut my prostrating. Koreo Mishtachabe both. But here he used to put an idol and his intent is to get the people to bow down to the idol. So I can't. So it says we're bothering him day after day. And the, the, the Megillah says, and, and then they finally told Haman in order to see what would happen, what, what would be from Mordechai. And the Megillah doesn't make any mention who they are. These troublemakers, they're the ones who really are the cause of all this problem. Because they're the ones who told on the revealed level. They're the ones who told Haman, you know, look, look what they did. There's they, they, they no mention who they are, what they did. It says what they did, and then it just... These, these guys should be punished. The, the, the Torah doesn't mention anything about them. That, look what they did. They're the ones who got Haman angered and heated up because they said to see what would be the reaction and what would happen with Mordechai is not bowing down. As if to say that these guys were troublemakers. No one talks about it. The, the Midrash, the Zohar, no one makes any, any statement of this. But this, this, this idea repeats itself that there's problems and it's always being covered up. Who's really guilty? You don't know who and this and that. It's repeating itself. Our mission is to reveal the truth, the real truth, that there's one God, there's one Torah, the tzaddikim, and this is the, the follow-up, this, this is the package, and to, to promote it, and pr pr promote the miracles generated by it, and the benefit of connecting to this, this, this package. In the beginning, not, uh, no mention of the word Hashem. Hashem, hidden, everything's hidden, hidden. Because again, that's for Hashem is the greatest accomplishment to be revealed from the conceit. She's called Esther. Why she's called Esther? Where, where, where the, sorry, the Gemara says, where is Esther learned out in the Torah? It's what Hashem says. Hashem says in the rebuke that Moshe Rabbeinu gives at the end of the Torah before his passing, that Hashem says, I'm going to conceal, will conceal, a double concealment my face on that day. What does that mean? Like the famous song that everyone's singing now, right? The Vafilu Ba'astara, there's a song going around, right? And even, it's from Rabbi Nachman's Lesson 56, that even within the concealment, within the concealment, Hashem is to be found there. The greatest example of that is Megillah Esther. Hashem is not mentioned <laughs> once, and yet from the concealment, within the concealment, we find Hashem. Hashem is to be found there. That's the miracle of Purim. As we find Hashem, I see you, even though you don't see him, he's hiding. But Hashem, I can see you, you can't hide from me. I see you behind the scenes. I see that you're doing all this, and I see you behind the picture. That's the idea of, of Yudke Vavke, coming out from behind the curtain. And that for Hashem is the greatest accomplishment. And that's connected a lot to the future redemption. Where everything, all the miracles of Mashiach, will be simply through nature. He won't have to shoot a single bullet, a single missile to conquer the world. Just with his power of speech, he's going to get everybody at his feet, the whole world. He won't, need, he won't have the need to do open miracles. It won't be necessary. He'll just have the power of speech to reveal Hashem behind the scenes, and that's how he's going to get the whole world at his feet. At Hashem's feet. Hashem. Question? Yes. One more question. Can you, you talked about it before. Can you just say again how Sarah represents holy speech? Yeah. Because the word Sarah corresponds to Serara, which means rulership. And all rulership is through speech. A ruler, a king, a minister, a governor, a, uh, you know, a, a mayor, anyone who has a rav, anyone who has a high position, they re reveal their will through speech. Even though eventually things become a proclamation and written, but it starts with the faculty of speech to reveal their will. You can only reveal what he wants done through speech. You can't read his mind. You can't read his mind. And if he's, if he's deaf and mute and he only writes, then why is he a king? <laughs> he's a ruler because he's mastered something. He's above the, the, the average person. So he has all, this, all the senses full, meaning that he has speech. And therefore, the, 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 the most usage of a ruler 
to express his will and desire what has to be done is through speech. So Sarah connotes this rulership of speech. However, it's not for her. It's to, to promote the rulership of Hashem in the world. That's the idea of Sarah, to promote the Hashem, Hashem's presence in the world. That was her team with Avraham. Avraham was yearning, yearning, and yearning how to spread the awareness of Hashem in the world. And through Sarah, he was able to do that. She was the power of prayer, the power of speech. Joined together with Avraham, they worked together in revealing Hashem in the world. He, Avraham needed Sarah. It couldn't be just Avraham alone. <coughs> he needed Sarah, which was his Sarah, his rulership. <coughs> the rulership to promote Hashem's rulership in the world. So that's the idea of Sarah and Sarara, and that's the idea of speech. And by the way, it's illustrated also in that when she was taken into Pharaoh, right, she told the angel to attack him. It says, <coughs> Ach, that the angel was waiting to listen to Sarah, whatever she ordered. And as soon as she gave the order, the angel inflicted Pharaoh with leprosy. It's called Baal Atan, a type of leprosy. We can't cohabit. He, he wanted to be with her. So he was inflicted with leprosy that, that knocked him out. He couldn't do anything that he wanted to do. And the Midrash makes a big deal. Al pi Sarah. The, the verse says, through the mouth of Sarah. That, 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 that he was inflicted by Naga Hashem at Beit Paro. And I think the verse continues, Al pi Sarah, through the mouth of Sarah. To show that that was her power. And it was meant to be revealed specifically in Paro's house. To reveal the power of Sarah, her speech, Dafka in the biggest realm of impurity, of evil, which is Paro's domain, Paro's house, and then to leave all these gifts, subduing Paro, and to get everything to come out. That's that. The, uh, the group of uh, men that were uh, uh, trying to get Haman to be angry. And, yeah, uh, right. So it could be that they were uh, angels, you know, sent by Hashem. Could be also. Yeah. I have, it, I have not yet seen anything. They were never... Right. It was talked about. Right. It could be. They weren't even humans. It was just to make the things to start moving. It could be. And I think we also uh, <coughs> have to recognize that we actually see the Purim story happening right before our eyes today. You know, on, on, a, on, the, on a world level. On a so. world level, yeah. yeah. Because we have uh, BB, you know, being attacked. And the, the hatred, you know, for Israel. Yeah. Um, it's unbelievable what's going on. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's so it, clear. It's, it's the Purim story. You know, Mordechai, and uh, you have Mordechai, mm -hmm. and it's happening right before us. Not only that, Bibi is going to go to the Congress on Anas Esther. That's when Esther... <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, maybe full point. And Skin, yeah. All right. and he's, and he's uh, we're fighting the same people 2,500 years ago and now, Iran. We're in Iran, it's the same. Parsi. Tradition, we should have miracles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Stop. Stop. Okay.